And welcome back to Your Region 120. I'm Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student of computer science at the University of Regina. And today we're going to be talking about another ancient Greek philosopher, uh, that is Thales of Miletus, if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, so this is going to be someone who was a pre-Socratic, i.e. was a philosopher before Socrates, uh, as Aristotle kind of split the ancient philosophers up into those kind of categories. Uh, and in particular, it's kind of hard to get anything from him that is certain uh, or, or is definitely true about him because he kind of lived long enough ago uh, that there was kind of a blurring between what actually happened uh, and kind of legend. Uh, and so, yes, uh, I think he did kind of uh, coexist with at least Socrates for a while uh, and was um, kind of a alive during the, the period of time uh, when people kind of could remember that he definitely existed, uh, as far as how much of what uh, he accomplished actually happened, and how much was kind of other people kind of uh, ascribed to him, uh, and how much of it was just kind of completely made up, uh, that it's hard to tell in retrospect, uh, especially since there wasn't really uh, any kind of serious uh, scientific history uh, for quite some time after his death. So. Um, this was someone who was around, uh, and he was a philosopher, quite probably the first philosopher worthy of the name, uh, the first physicist, uh, and really helped with creating the intellectual background necessary for what philosophy would mean as a field, uh, and what science would end up being uh, kind of later on. Uh, so he was apparently the guy who coined the term know thyself, uh, which ended up being put on the temple at Delphi, I believe, um, and was kind of a, a, a respected person, ended up having a political career, uh, but also was involved in quite a few other things as we'll kind of get into. Uh, apparently he predicted an eclipse, uh, a solar eclipse, uh, in 585 BC, which apparently if you go and kind of check the solar records of when an eclipse should have occurred, uh, that's a, there should have been an eclipse that he correctly predicted, uh, and whether or not he accurately uh, predicted it based on pure guesswork, or however he did it, we don't know to this day, uh, he somehow managed to predict it, and because of that, uh, got a little bit of a attention by the, the kind of local smart people of his time, including Democritus, uh, of all people. And uh, apparently there was a battle being fought, the eclipse happened, during the battle, the battle stopped, the peace agreement was signed, uh, in part quite possibly because one of the sides had Thales uh, to their credit, and everyone knew that he was predicting an eclipse would happen. Uh, so this is kind of one of the impacts of that uh, event, it may have had political consequences in the region. Uh, he also uh, did other things. Uh, he w invented the ratio of all things, so that you have kind of one to two, so or two to one odds uh, ratio. It's a kind of a simple concept, uh, but that's his idea of at least expressing it that way. And it's he's got a lot of ideas, kind of um, that were apparently from him, uh, and he did write, uh, and at least up until. Uh, Aristocles' day. Uh, his writings did survive that long, uh, but he didn't write all that much. Apparently he only wrote about 200 lines total, uh, and mostly in epic verse, uh, which was kind of par for the course around the time. That, that would not be uh, that uncommon for people who were writing uh, to be writing in that form. Uh, one of my friends on uh, actually wrote a haiku about him, uh, which I will, I guess, read here. Kind of gives it a, a kind of an introduction to the kind of next part here, quote, My world is water, all things from and to water, floating on water, unquote. That's from Seth Mahoney. Uh, and uh, that, that is actually kind of the, the essence of Thales' uh, view of the world. Uh, he would have lived by the ocean, or by the sea at least, the uh, Mediterranean, um, or, or whatever they call the it's part of the Mediterranean by uh, Greece there, uh, and uh, so he, he would have lived around water quite some, for quite some time and came to view all things uh, as from water. Uh, all things eventually gets washed away and kind of eroded back into water. 
uh, and he would have viewed uh, over his lifetime and over the lifetime of his kind of parents and grandparents generation uh, an increasing amount of land available from the Mediterranean and the islands that were there uh, due to either deposits from rivers or just from the Mediterranean dropping regardless of how it was the, the geological uh, function causing it uh, there was more land being seemed to be produced from the water and so it's almost like the water is kind of giving birth to these islands and, and if you didn't know exactly you know that that there was a broader world out there uh, thinking that the water was kind of giving birth to uh, land was not a bad guess in retrospect uh, and so he would have viewed evaporation uh, as um, the mist itself, or, or rather, the prior to Thales, uh, people would have viewed uh, the, the kind of mist coming off of the water uh, as something that provides nutrition to people, uh, and the idea that bugs kind of spawn into existence uh, spontaneously, and that there's spontaneous generation of life happening all the time around them, which again, if you don't know exactly how life uh, evolved, uh, that's not a terrible guess of where all these bugs keep coming from, especially if you leave flour alone for a while. Uh, and he had seen metal return to its liquid state by being heated. Uh, there was certainly, uh, I, I think, pretty sure the Bronze Age had already kind of started in earnest by that point. Uh, and uh, so there, there was certainly stuff uh, suggesting that there would be uh, kind of this simpler uh, state of matter that matter coalesced from. Of course, he wouldn't know about plasma yet. Uh, but evidence wouldn't come against his ideas on these matters until about 1769 by Antoine Lavoisier, uh, and spontaneous generation wouldn't be discounted until Louis Pasteur kind of took experiments in that direction of in the mid-19th century. And so he, he's got kind of a working hypothesis to describe where life comes from, where Greece uh, kind of originated from, and uh, has has these kind of mechanical descriptions of where things are, are originating from. And regardless of whether they're true or not, they, they came from more or less testable arguments uh, and more or less testable predictions about where things came from and that had implications on where things would continue to come from in a way that wasn't directly tied with the gods or some kind of spiritual influence, which was kind of a new thing at the time. And so he kind of viewed the world as uh, this thing that was given birth to by the water and was floating on the water, uh, and so that there was he, there was islands nearby uh, Miletus that were uh, made of uh, pumice uh, and a, a kind of very light rock, and those islands would have actually seemed to be floating uh, and could very well have been floating. Uh, just really, really large pieces of humus. And uh, so he may have seen those islands and kind of expected the, the entire rest of the, the continent uh, that he was surrounded by uh, to also be made of the same kind of ma material on the bottom, kind of keeping it afloat in the middle of the water. And uh, so th this was kind of his view of things, that whether or not it was right, it was a moderately scientific uh, first stab at things. And though it tur didn't turn out to be correct, uh, because it was testable, people could test it. Or, or it was close to being testable, people could test it. And we can kind of look down on uh, him because, oh, well, you know, it's ridiculous to have you know, no ocean floor or anything like that. But we all the continental drift theory alone uh, didn't get discounted until the 20th century. So that, that's you know, almost within my lifetime <laughs> that we still didn't really fully understand how the continents were formed, and so he's pr presenting a theory of how that you know, could have happened, uh, regardless of whether it's right or not. Um, we're still kind of hashing out some of the details of that, so uh, we can't be uh, too picky on that account. But uh, it, he was an interesting guy, and there, there was, in fact, uh, seven sages of which he was one. So if you remember, if you ever played the original Final Fantasy 1, in Final Fantasy 1 there's these kind of seven, or I think in Final Fantasy 1 it's 12 sages, but in either case, it seems to be they were modeled after this guy and some of his peers who were actually called the seven sages. Uh, and they were kind of the, the smart people of the, the local region. 
Uh, he was the first uh, to kind of seriously study, or, or he, he was the first of his kind of local area to seriously study astronomy. Uh, obviously, the uh, First Nations groups in Canada, who by most likely it had predated his study of astronomy to some extent, uh, as well as the Central American uh, uh, peoples as well. Uh, but certainly in the local area, he kind of had a, a head start on others in terms of mapping out the sky, understanding the movement of the stars, etc. Uh, but he was the first uh, to understand and document the solstices uh, and their relation to the seasons, at least among the Greeks. Uh, he believed and was apparently one of the first to believe in an immortal soul uh, and one of the first to imagine that all ma matter uh, was kind of embedded with the soul uh, and that uh, apparently th there's this kind of way of thinking about matter that uh, includes a soul uh, as part of all of it, uh, regardless of, again, whether it's correct or not, uh, it's kind of a, a first step towards different ways of looking at that kind of question. Uh, and he was apparently the first to use and suggest the use of the li Little Dipper uh, as part of a navigation aid for people on ships, which is kind of an important thing if you're a nation on trading. And so he's involved with a lot of things, but one of the more kind of important areas, uh, in addition to this kind of theory of uh, geology uh, based on water, uh, is his work in geometry itself. Now, again, it's unclear how much of this is his work and how much of it is the Babylonians and the Egyptians before him who he just happened to learn their results. Um, they, the Babylonians and Egyptians did have advanced geometry, uh, but it wasn't all that abstract, so they would know how to use it in practice, but it wasn't clear how to kind of generalize the results from it to do more with it than they were currently able to do. And he was able to make that happen. Uh, he brought geometry from the Egyptians and from the Babylonians to the Greeks, and he was the first guy to realistically do that. Uh, he taught, or he would have been part of the teaching process of teaching Pythagoras uh, geometry and Euclid geometry. Uh, and in fact, many of Euclid's theorem, or at least a couple of Euclid's theorems, were first discovered by Thales. Uh, and so there's even a theorem kind of named after him, which is pretty easy to describe. You have a circle. have to imagine that this is actually a circle. You have a diameter of a circle. We go from A over here to B. And then you can pick any other point on the circle. Let's say this one. And then make a triangle with that. Thales' uh, theorem is that that is a right angle triangle. Which makes sense if you kind of draw the flip side of that triangle uh, because then it becomes a rectangle inside of this circle. Um, kind of makes sense to me anyway. I don't know about you guys, but uh, this is his result. So he, you, he thought this up and uh, the theorems that he thought up, he actually had practical applications for. Uh, so there was kind of a split by him uh, in between advances in geometry and practical applications. Of course, the Babylonians and the Egyptians used all their stuff all the time, uh, but it wasn't clear that this would have an application, but he found one very quickly. Uh, he apparently didn't know all that much about degrees, so he wouldn't have known necessarily that uh, Triangles, for example, have 180 degrees and circles have 360. Uh, and it wasn't that there was just some other measure of angle that he would have known. Uh, it's just that <coughs> is one of the things that would have been developed later on by Pythagoras or Euclid or something. Uh, and so when he was using or when he was doing geometry, uh, his proofs did not look like kind of more modern uh, Euclid's like proofs uh, in that uh, he didn't really reason deductively so much as inductively. Uh, he would make kind of educated guesses and 
uh, kind of work exhaustively by measuring ang or maybe not measuring angles by degree, but kind of measuring in terms of uh, things you could measure and things that you could find out. And so uh, it was a very uh, kind of primitive process of proving stuff like this, and the proofs weren't exactly rigorous, uh, but nevertheless, he did find this relationship. Uh, and because of his work with, I guess, predicting the eclipse, because of his work in politics, in astronomy, in geometry, uh, the who's who of the intellectual world of the pre-Socratic age uh, knew who he was and knew of his ideas and knew what he thought about the universe, or at least of the world. And uh, so many of the people who knew him and knew about him uh, are those who appear in Aristarchus' uh, dialogues. So if you go view that video, uh, you can kind of get a, a sense for uh, his impact on the world as interpreted through them uh, and as inspiring through or inspiring them to basically follow their particular paths. And in, partic in particular, Aristarchus uh, may not have had access to Thales' work directly, uh, only through Pythagoras, uh, if he encountered his ideas uh, in kind of direct form at all. And so there's, you know, he, he's, he's made all these advances, he's, he's come up with these ideas in geometry like this, uh, and he's viewed as this kind of smart guy. Uh, but it wasn't, uh, you know, the best reputation to have. Uh, he apparently fell into a well because he was watching the stars one day, and this is just kind of a, an example of, you know, how people were kind of mocking him for using his brain to solve problems, which is unfortunately uh, something that uh, kind of persists to this day that you still have people that are kind of bullied and uh, looked down upon for being computer geeks or what have you, uh, that you know, he would have recognized that uh, in his life. And so people uh, at, at one point of his life kind of uh, mocked him uh, using a uh, argument that I've kind of heard myself many times, which is, quote, you know, why don't you use some of those smarts of yours to invest in something and you know, maybe invest in the stock market and get rich or something. Um, and, you know, there, there wasn't really much of a stock market back then. Uh, that, I think, had yet to be invented. But there were certainly markets, and there were certainly tra commercial transactions that were taking place. Uh, and so he somehow figured out, uh, and figured out a, some kind of a pattern in uh, the using the stars or otherwise uh, between when there would be good uh, olive crops and when there would not be good olive crops. And one winter, when he figured that there would be a really good olive crop, uh, he bought all of the olive presses in Miletus. And because it was winter, and because the you know previous crop was not all that good, uh, he was able to get away uh, with buying all the olive presses, or at least most of them. And so when the season came around to make olive oil from all these olives, uh, anyone who had olives had to go to him to get you know to rent time on his olive presses, uh, which he now had the monopoly on. And so he was able to extract a lot of monopoly rent from that and get fairly rich from it, um, which, again, he didn't do to necessarily get rich, although that was probably a nice side effect, uh, but just to show that you could apply philosophy and you could apply your brain to practical matters, and it actually works. You can actually plan ahead a little bit and make these kind of strategic moves. Aristotle pointed out that making a monopoly wasn't exactly something that needed a lot of wisdom, as described in the Socrates video, and the Aristocles video, but it was certainly would have shut up the people that were mocking him for a while. So in addition to all that, uh, Thales was also a child-free, apparently. Uh, he didn't have a wife, and, quote, did not like the idea of having to take care of children, unquote, which I can totally understand that uh, perspective. Uh, and it's also worth pointing out that his parents were from an area roughly around modern-day Syria. And so when we think of all these people that are kind of struggling to survive, streaming out of the war-torn areas uh, kind of in, in Syria and region, um, it's worth considering that the person who founded uh, philosophy that inspired the founding of Western civilization was themselves uh, ethnically Syrian or from, from that region uh, of the world. And so it, it's worth at least considering that this is the basis of all of our 
geometry, all of our science, all of our math, you know, pretty, pretty much everything that we have in the modern world dates to this guy and his influence on the others that have described in this video series. Uh, so if we want to, you know, risk uh, missing someone like that coming from another set of Syrian uh, immigrants, uh, you know, by all means, but uh, just be wary uh, when considering the, the people that are, again, are streaming out and looking for a, a safe place to raise their kids, uh, that we could be missing out on the next Thales. So, uh, hopefully uh, you enjoy this video. As usual, if there are any questions about Thales, uh, again, there's there's a lot of legend uh, surrounding him and hard, hard to tell uh, truth from fiction, but uh, uh, hopefully uh, I, uh, I've got the right idea here. Um, and as usual, there should be a Bitcoin donation address if you want to, uh, I guess, support this video series. We'll see you next video.